game in development, Send Space Drone Runners. And this is on a 7-inch Kindle. These cost about 40 bucks now. I think they're a nice, nice gaming size. Good hand comfort. So technically, this is uh, listening to me right now with the microphone. Oh. Yeah, so um, well, let's just get started here. So this is what my um, format encoding looks like. You can zoom in on it. What I'm doing here is I'm adjusting a range. So I, I recorded 600 uh, spectrums at 25 spectrums per second. Then you can like drag the middle to sort of slide it across. Same size window. And then you can play it back. And here I'm using um, voice frequencies as opposed to musical frequencies. But let's see if there's anything useful in here at all. So this is um, these two, uh, you know, hard parallel lines. That's me holding a tone over time. It's time, frequency. Whereas over here, I mean, you always see it's it's kind of like a little flag. These are like the lines on a flag rippling, and it it's basically that the ripples are caused by two things. One is they're each line is at a regular spacing above the line below it because the lines are just harmonics. So the bottom line is the fundamental and then there's the second, third, fourth, fifth harmonics going up and um, as the bottom line weaves up and down, all of the harmonics weave up and down the same amount. So you, you see the wave. And then those harmonics, they're each an individually different frequency. They have to fight their way through the resonant cavity of the throat and lungs and tongues and lips and all that stuff and um, some of them get lost in the process some of them get attenuated they get cut down if I were to turn the gain up on my little meter here you'd see that they were all pretty much still there just dra you know between here and here they are all very drastically attenuated but yeah the the interesting structure and like the places where there appear to be fewer lines are just places where you are filtering out those lines because the the excitation signal in, in coming from your vocal cords is usually sort of a sawtoothy or pulsy kind of signal, a signal that is rich in harmonics. But if you, you know, turn your voice into a beautiful aria, you become almost a pure sine wave, at which point this line becomes just straight and clean. And I don't know, did I whistle after that? Um, yeah, so that's probably my whistle. So let's listen. This should be my kind of singing, and then this should be my kind of whistle. Yeah. And that's the other thing you can do with this control. If you just tap in a, in a region, um, it shows you the spectrum at that moment in time. So we can see it had these peaks in it. And if you just look at this, it's like, if that's the fundamental, that could quite possibly be the second harmonic and that could quite possibly be the third harmonic and that is almost definitely the fourth harmonic so this is the frequency of my excitation can i tell you what that frequency is i don't know if that's trustworthy here i may be telling you the musical scale but this will be down in the 100 hertz range uh, um, and then these are just harmonics. And the harmonics just come with the fact that this wasn't a sine wave, that this is some scratchy thing that my vocal cords are making. And it comes with harmonics. <clears throat> and then the harmonics get further filtered. And we just, well, actually, let's get rid of those samples. Let's record some actual tech, I mean, speech. Well, about time. Okay, and it's early morning again, and I don't really mean to be irritating anybody's slumber. 
Okay, so uh, well about time, something like that, right? Yeah, so what you're hearing there is the spectral playback, so it's 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 just recreating the original spectrums by adding together sine waves, weighted sine waves at the frequencies. Like, for example, for this moment here, there's only one peak, so it's putting up pretty much just a sine wave. Okay, so I've already forgotten what it said, so if we switch back to samples and play it, about time and now something like about t the t that's only going to show up like see right here there's like some stuff way up high higher than normal that's generally indication of some white noise some sh sh some air <sighs> anyway and then the thing the only i'm hesitating here because i wanted to hear what this sounded like with the format player Yeah, speak and spell mode here. Um, I think this is promising. I like this. Yeah, I think that's 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 what I'm going for. That's that's my that's my target. What I actually have to demonstrate today is the new button here on the far left. But it comes with the ability to, you know, a full synthesizer so you can make your own instruments, a full sequencer so you can record and edit your own songs, um, multiple diagnostic oscilloscopy kind of things. Um, doesn't <laughs> The one thing right now it doesn't come with are any instruments so basically you have to make all of your own instruments from scratch or get them from other people other players which you will get automatically if they share their music with you it'll also share the instruments used um but i've made a lot of instruments over time not necessarily great ones but most recently i've been making these uh, fm using fm synthesis and um, so this new button here, it's that says ARP, ARP as short for arpeggiator, and I don't really know what I'm going to call it yet and what color it's going to be, but this is functionally pretty much what it's going to do, I think. It's set to strum right now, so this is like the simplest case. So let's change it to like up. So this will go do 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 do. So whatever chord you pick, and you pick, this is picking a chord. You, it's not like a, a keyboard where you can, I could play the chord myself. Like that's a C chord. I'm set to C major, so the one chord in C major is in fact C major. So this should be the same chord, and it comes with a bunch of different arpeggiation patterns. We're running right now at 80 beats per minute and that was the one chord. So here's suddenly the four chord and that's really slow so we could speed that up up here or we can tell it oh we'd like to have two arpeggiation steps per beat. But it's worse over here for other reasons. <clears throat> but um, anyway, so this was not the demo I wanted to give, unfortunately. There's some fairly complicated... And they can go pretty fast. Um, okay, I think what my problem is here is I've got it set to an instrument that I'm not enjoying. So the way you change the instrument used by the by the arpeggiator is you pick an instrument that you think you'd like to hear. Uh, 
I think that might be what we have. Let's try tuba. Tuba tuba arpeggiation. So we have it selected, tuba. And now, just like any other shortcut, we just hold it down until we hear the little sound. And now the arpeggiations are tubas. If, if that's a tuba, which, you know, it's debatable, it would be a different octave. So then the idea is you just start recording a new track. Um, I do, for whatever reason, blink the little ARP button right now, which looks more like I'm trying to get your attention. The idea is that's a metronome. You can turn on latch mode, and I'll just keep playing until I push on another button. And I was going to make it so that if I wanted silence, And now I can, the tube is locked to the arpeggiator, but I can pick a different instrument now for the keyboard. Anyway, it gets fun. Oops. Um, now it's possible that the beats per minute for the song is not the right thing to use for the arpeggiator, or that the arpeggiator maybe, maybe I should even consider going above four. But I had a hard time getting the arpeggiator to work well at, at any fast rate.
Oh, I guess I didn't point out the important part here is that th that was all in C major. If I switch it to, let's say, D minor, then it's still the chords 1 through 7, but these are now the 1 through 7 chords for the key of D minor. So you don't have to figure it out. But to be educational, it tells you what they are. And what you can see here is the lowercase Roman numerals, those are minor, and the uppercase Roman numerals are major chords. These are each chords. There are seven chords, seven legal, seven official chords in a key. That lat button right now is the latch, and you turn it on or off, and while it's on, then it has latching behavior, and while it has latching behavior, to turn the latching behavior off, you have to turn this off. So if it's stuck on, you can't remember how to turn it off. I can't turn it off. Tap lat a second time and it turns it off. Zero meaning off, of course. I'm not used to this yet where the individual note colors are showing. They're my rainbow colors. A little garish, but it's kind of interesting. You know, you can see regular patterns. You can see um, if, if there were sections that repeated, you would see the, you know, if I played the same thing twice, you would see it appear twice, even in this condensed format. So it's kind of neat. This is going to be like a three minute song and you can still kind of get an idea of what's going on. So I recently went back to working with this seven inch Kindle because I've been spending all my time with a 10 inch Kindle. And I've, as I've said on several occasions, the 10 inch Kindles are pretty fast. So it's easy to make it so that even though it runs well on a 10 inch Kindle, maybe it doesn't run well on a seven inch Kindle anymore. Like the 10 inch will be like 40 to 50 frames per second here, when it's not doing anything else, when it's just space gaming. And I keep the UI thread separate from everything else, or I try to, so as if, if something in the music world does get laggy, it doesn't cause the game to pause. Now it does cause the music to pause. Um, I have noticed on the 7 incher here, if I pick the um, tubular bells and bind them to the quarter. Huh. Yeah. The other thing about tubular bells is they're they're really long. They're set for 3000 milliseconds and math is being done on its behalf. And so if I hit two of those guys, you know, within a second of each other, then there's going to be a couple of seconds during which there's two notes playing. And if I start with three guys, then there's a couple of seconds where there's three notes playing. And when I do the arpeggiator, depending on how I have, you know, the speed set up, it generates do 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 It generates a lot of them really quickly, and so there's a lot of them running at the same time. And at some point, that tasks your processor chip on your... Um, on your device and it starts to break up like that and if, obviously it's incumbent upon me to make that you know not happen and given that it's inevitable for in this kind of in our environment I would just have to be more careful about maybe abandoning notes that were uh, almost almost dead anyway maybe well if I ever do uh, add a sort of a gain control to the tracks maybe that would be a good time to also think about stereo and being able to place a track left right and that's even I agree that's getting a little overkill for a space game just blabbering hoping that I'll say something interesting
<laughs> anyway. Um, it's just supposed to be fun. That's all it has to do. Be fun. So the other thing I wanted to do was I made this schematic of the synthesizer and I need some documented footage of this. So my notebook. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it a little zoomed in with the hopes being that it'll be easier to see. So, what is my synthesizer in the game Send Space Drone Runners? A space game where you can craft your own star map adventures and share with other players, and that can include all sorts of fun, exciting side things, including music, for which you have your own synthesizer and can make your own instruments and your own sequencer and can make your own songs and your own um, vocoder so you can record yourself humming or singing or playing an instrument and turn that into notes to be part of your song that you then put in your star map in Sin Space Drone Runners, a space game. In theory. In practice, it's just something to mess around with, both for you and for me. And the basic concept is something along these lines. There is a little keyboard. Oh, hey, I can have a live demo at the same time. But, you know, we it's a space game. You can pinch them. You can bring up the piano. You can look at the new chording arpeggiator. So there's a keyboard. And you can pick different instruments. And these are just shortcuts to this big list of instruments, which you can pick from also. Oh, that's cool. Sounds just a little vocal. How did I do that? That's one oscillator and a filter. So that's, yeah, this was me trying to mock up my little format playback unit. With, right, then I turned on um, Glissando so I get a gliding between frequencies. So that gliding is what gives you the change of the lower lowest format frequency. And then past that, the filter controls uh, a simulation of the resonant cavity. So if I wanted to have it sound, you know, more speechy, then you would, you know, be modifying your resonant cavity in some way. But um, that should be coordinated so that you're making a particular sound, like a particular vowel sound or something. I was just testing it. And it works. I mean, if I needed a fake voice, you know, if I needed a Charlie Brown parent voice. And there'll be little songs that would sound angry or happy or whatever. You could do stuff with this. Not a plan, but you could. Well, like in your star map, you could use this so that when the radio came up to... Um, deliver a message from an NPC, maybe you could just play something like this. Ah, a little Stephen Hawking there. Um, so, I was going to show this. That's the keyboard. 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 So, that's this keyboard here. It's not velocity sensitive, it's just a touchpad. You're either touching a key or you're not touching a key. Uh, each key is an independent creature. Um, it's polyphonic. You can hold. Hello. 
helicopter. Uh, it's a real helicopter. Um, <laughs> the full keyboard is five octaves, of which you only can see about two at a time. You move them with this control, although I think I'd rather have a control down here to do that, but we'll see. Um, so you have a total of 64 keys, black and white combined. So I've indicated this as like there are 64 control signals. And in synthesizer terms, I guess you'd call these gates. And you can think of them as, as something that's normally here. And when you pull the key down, this voltage goes up. And when you let the key down, or re release the key, the voltage goes back down. So there's the start of a note and there's the release of a note. And nothing can happen until the note starts, but even after you release the note, the note can continue sounding for a while, but it should begin winding up its business as soon as the release happens. Um, and some notes may be designed to terminate instantly, and some may want to linger. So for example, if we go to the synthesizer, uh, let's change to a different instrument. So, this one is a good one for not lingering. So you turn it on, it runs to this point, this green red boundary. This green red boundary is the point of sustain. So if I hold the key down, it plays the envelope up to this point, holds, and then when I let go, it goes off almost instantly. Whereas I, what I could do is, um, move all these points over here, say, and then, and then when, when I let go, it's going to stay high for a while. And this is 444 milliseconds total. So that's about 300 milliseconds. So it'll continue high for about 300 milliseconds before then dropping off. So I let go, uh, well, to make that more obvious, we'll change this to three seconds, 3,000 milliseconds. Now it says 3,000 milliseconds. So now this is like three seconds, well, it's like two seconds. So I hold the button and now it's paused here and I let go now. And it took a while before it went on. So the gate was from gate start, gate end, and it fades out. So there's 64 gate signals, which means you might say, well, so you can play 64 notes at the same time? Kinda. Uh, I think I would let you try. Um, I think I'd let you try up to 100 notes at the same time. But I don't have any tablets powerful enough to run that much math. So, sorry. So anyway, so that's, that is, so when, when there's a rising edge on the gate signal, on any one of the gate signals, when there's a rising edge, it causes a note to be created and put into the note cloud. So I have this, this cloud of notes that are alive. You know, their gate has gone on and it's either still on or it's gone off, but they haven't finished their envelope yet. So they're still alive. So active notes are in the note cloud and gate starts are what create new notes. And when a new note is born, the universe is a brand new universe and it just starts synthesizing from scratch. It's got its own copy of all the data. It doesn't know anything about the other notes necessarily. It's just doing its business and following its gate signal. Um, but that's just one way to add notes to the note cloud. You can also use the cording arpeggiator. I didn't know that was already there. And, um, Arpeggiator logic? I see. I see. So the chord keyboard through the arpeggio logic has its own 64 gates because it also can make lots of simultaneous notes. And again, any any time it has a rising edge on its gate, it creates a new note in the note cloud. And because the arpeggiator's job is to go do 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 it's sending out a lot of gates. So it's generating a lot of notes. Um, then there's also the concept of, 
uh, playing back a groove. And so when, when you've recorded a groove in the past, you can um, play it. <laughs> and when you play it, the groove, which is just data about the song, um, recreates gate signals, which then create new notes in the note cloud. And then finally we have the vocoder where basically sound input going through the vocoder, going to the vocoder can be processed in a way that generates additional notes, additional, you know, additional gate events that create new notes. So now everything up here is basically what happens in a note. Well, I, I guess this dashed line here shows the, uh, everything, to the everything to the left of there is, is the note. And to the right of that, this is common. So the reverb, for example, each note does not have its own reverb. If, I, if there's five notes playing, they, I, I synthesize the five notes and add them together. And then that, that sum is what goes through reverb. And this is basically, it says saying it's reverb. Uh, oh, but the, per <clears throat> the percussion sound effects, they just go straight to the speaker. They're, they're pre-captured samples. They don't even go through the reverb. It's an abasement of all that's holy. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's, I was desperate. I think with the FM synth, I could now at least make, you know, FM synth percussion, and that would probably be good enough. But anyway, I did that. It exists. It's not coming out. So here's the basic uh, design. And what I've tried to do is use certain shapes over and over again. Um, this little shape here, those little those little lines, those little three little lines, and ATT, that's an attenuator. So that's one of these things. Okay. So you, you touch them and you drag up or you drag down. Um, it will cut a signal by a certain number of dB. If it's all the way up, then it cuts it by 0 dB, which means it just passes the signal. If it's all the way down, I haven't lifted up my finger yet. If it's all the way down, it's minus 32 dB, which basically is silence. Okay, so that's an attenuator, and there's a lot of them. And they're pretty much all in a row here, except for the filter, it has two. Uh, what happens? A note is created in, a gate, in response to a gate event, and it lives in the note cloud. Then in the note cloud, every, every sample moment, I have to step through the full synthesizer for every, you know, for every track, for every note, for every oscillator, for every filter. It's just got to do all the math that it required to generate one sample. And then a moment later, it's got to do all that math again to do one sample. Now, in fact, I tend to batch it so they'll do like about a hundred samples at a time. Okay, so now I can't really see here, but I believe this m middle row here is the thing that's most evocative of the modules as they appear in the interface. But there's the FM module, then there's the oscillators 1 through 9, which I've abbreviated here, and then there's the filter, and then there's the AM module, and then there's the reverb, and then there's out to the speaker. And so that's pretty much the, the things that affect the module. Now, all up here are all the contour generators. So that was all of, that was all of these guys. And I don't know if I mentioned, but these little black lines, they're, they're the, the peers, they're the brothers. So sometimes you need to have them kind of line up. And so it's nice to see them at the same time. Um, and again, these are these all these six envelopes. They're whatever you made them, and they are private to the patch. Um, so the basic idea of the mixers of the oscillators, oscillator, oscillator, oscillators. These are the guys that, generally speaking, get credit for making the noise. So they they generate a sine wave or a sawtooth or something like that, and then their output is goes through an attenuator. So they're all really loud to start with, and they can be cut down in volume. And then their output goes to this mixer. So all the oscillators. So in this one instrument, in this one patch, in this one note, 
over the life of this one note, and every note has its own contragenerous, its own oscillators, its own everything. Um, this one note's point of view, um, when the gate pulse started it, all of these contours started firing at the same time. They were all triggered at the beginning of the note, at the gate event. Okay, so in general you see this pattern here a lot, and I've talked about it in other places, so I'm just going to kind of be vague here. So basically, the gate comes in, it triggers the contour generator, it's a, it's a shape that starts, it goes up, it goes down, it wiggles, it pauses, it holds for you to let, wait for you to let go of the key, and then it falls to zero and it's over. It's just a voltage. Well, that voltage is then goes through this range control. So we see this again, like in the FM module, that the voltage from the um, from the contra generator, like say this contra generator is wired to this um, LFO, it's wired basically to this range control. So when the contour is all the way up versus all the way down. The range control specifies what that means. So in this case, it says, well, when you're all the way down, it's 6.4 hertz, and when you're all the way up, it's 10.7 hertz. And you can, you know, muck with that. Oh, it's not even enabled right now, but you can still muck with it here. We'll turn it on. Big FM. A little too big. Let's make a weird envelope here. So that's the envelope is just going from all the way up to all the way down. And then we go to the vibrato and we say, well, all the way up, we'll say will be really high, like 21 hertz. And all the way down, we'll say will be zero. So what's that going to sound like? So it's starting out high pitched. And getting lower and lower. The vibrato is is starting off really fast and then it's slowing down now. And um, so what we're looking at here is the actual control signal. The basically the output of this LFO. There's this pattern that repeats where a contour generator controls a range control which selects a frequency and then an LFO oscillates at that frequency with a selected wave shape and then its output its loud output is attenuated and then that attenuated LFO output is used to, as a control signal somewhere. See this pattern CG range control LFO attenuator control signal thing being controlled. So we have one controlling our FM we have one controlling our noise, we have one controlling our AM, we have one controlling the, the center frequency value of the filter, we have one controlling the, gain, the Q value of the filter, just all the same pattern, the same flexible little circuitry. This contour generator, when count, connected to this oscillator, the only thing it does is it acts as a voltage controlled amplifier source. So, um, and that shape then takes whatever the oscillator is set to, a sine wave, triangle wave, square wave, whatever, and it, and it actually changes its size over time. So this oscillator, just because of this contour directly controlling the amplitude of this oscillator, can do a note. Bong, bong, bong. Each oscillator can be bound to a contour generator, which as long as you don't run out of contour generators. Um, and then we're going to add them all together in the mixer. And so this oscillator oscillating at this frequency, and this oscillator operating at this other frequency, and this oscillator operating at yet another frequency. And maybe this one's attenuator is full strength, and this one's half strength, and this one's way down low. And then they're added together and mixed together, and together they make a sound. So we we go to the synthesizer, we turn off, we'll just do the experiment we just set. So we'll have three oscillators, and 
they are at three different frequencies. This one's at minus 12, which means one octave below whatever note you hold on the keyboard. Can you see that at the same time? Okay. So if I hold the C key, then this is going to, so this is middle C, but this oscillator is playing it an octave below middle C. And this oscillator is playing at seven half steps or a perfect fifth above middle C. So this should be playing a, a, a G. And then this one should be playing the actual C. So if I disable these two and listen to just this one, it should be a middle C. If I disable this one and disable this one, that same key should sound like a G. And if I disable this one and just enable this one, this should be a C, but it should be down an octave, which you can't hear because of the speaker. Okay, so now we put them together, and we get a, a more complicated note. But notice these guys are all green when we have this. When contra generator one is selected, when it's the blue one, these three are green. That means they are following him. Okay, so getting back to this dude. So you've got your three oscillators. You've got your nine oscillators. Each can be driven by a contour generator. Well, each is driven by a contour generator. So these guys are always wired to something. They default to be wired to contour generator one. Um, <clears throat> and so for every note, they all get gated at the same time. All the contours start at the same time. The oscillators are all being controlled at the same time. They're all oscillating at the same time. They're each oscillating in a frequency controlled by the, the gate event itself, the key that you that you touched, controls the, the, the center frequency for this note. And then there's an offset that we saw here that you can just move up or down. So I'm just hitting the C key. Why does that sound so horrible? This is just... Oh, I'm not selected on him. Nice. Um, okay, so he's up seven right now, a perfect fifth. So let's just show that the offset makes it go up and down. I'm holding down the C key. So it's down two octaves is as far as I let you go. And 39 is as far as I go in that direction. Okay. Now, uh, say you find some description of an instrument and it says, oh, you need, the, you need the third harmonic. And if you need the third harmonic, that means you need a frequency that's three times the center frequency in this case. So that turns out to be 19 half steps, but how would you know? Well, curiously enough, that's 12 half steps plus seven half steps, where 12 half steps is an octave and seven half steps is a perfect fifth. And it sort of, you know, feels kind of natural that that should be something and a third harmonic is what it is. Um, but anyway, the point is that in addition to doing the uh, semitones here, I tell you, I have a little cheat sheet up here in the corner telling you what your, your X factor is. So this is, exactly the third harmonic. This is a little above the third harmonic. And if you want to find the fourth harmonic, well, that'll be exact, 24. If you want to find the fifth harmonic, it's not exact, but it's, you know, it's as close as you're going to get. If you want the sixth harmonic, can you see this? I think you can see that. If you want the sixth harmonic, again, it's not exact. And then the seventh harmonic, not very good. And then the eighth harmonic, yeah, of course, that was great. And then 9.5. So, oh, 8.98, I guess that's close enough for ninth to say that it could handle it. Okay, so technically, and what, what happens is in a freshly cleared instrument, the oscillators come pre-wired so that oscillator one is at the fundamental and oscillators two is at the second harmonic, third, fourth, fifth, up to ninth harmonic and the oscillator nine. If I actually select oscillator nine, you can see the vestiges of that. It was already set to 8.98, so it's not exactly the ninth harmonic. And that's probably enough of an error to make a noticeable difference, but
tough. Um, oh yeah, I'm doing this. Um, okay, so we have seen that, um, that that is the case. But for each oscillator, we also have this section called algorithm. And it has a thing called destination and feedback. And feedback just enables feedback in the oscillator itself. So the oscillator's own output is fed back into its... Each oscillator has both an amplitude modulation input and also an FM modulation input. And this FM guy is one of the sources of wiggle on the FM modulation input. But in addition, added to the FM guy, if he exists, is this other FM input, which can be driven from the oscillator to your left. So each oscillator can FM modulate the oscillator to its right. So I'm the modulator, you are the carrier, I am modulating you. And as a modulator, you can also tell me to turn on feedback so that my own output, the very same signal that I'm sending to you, will be fed back into my own FM. If, you know, so I'm now adding together three different things. I'm adding together the FM from the FM system, the, the vibrato system, um, the FM from... Uh, God, what did I just say? Anyway, and from the module to my left, from the oscillator to my left. So oscillator one doesn't doesn't get that. But oscillator, all the other oscillators have an oscillator to their left, and they can get one or more oscillators to the left. They can get a signal from the oscillator to their left. But they can also get an oscillate, a signal from the oscillator two to their left and three to their left. Um, so you can actually, I can, I can have these three oscillators, and they can all in parallel be driving this oscillator. Or I can concatenate them in series, pretend that's an oscillator for a minute. I can concatenate them in series and have three in series coming up with a control signal that's controlling an oscillator. And that's all done through this, um, this uh, destination field. Okay. So I have these three oscillators in my FM synthesis. And what I do is I say, this one's going to be my output. So I'm going to call it my carrier. And these two I'm going to call my modulators. So I'm going to take the first modulator and tell it I want his destination. Take, select this first modulator until I want his destination not to mixer, but to cascade 1, FM cascade 1, which makes this little line appear, which tells me that oscillator 2 is modulating oscillator 3. Now if I go to oscillator 1, who's currently going to the mixer, if I change him to FM Cascade 1, then we see another line appears, and so now 1 is modulating 2, and then 2 is modulating 3, and then 3 is not modulating anybody, we just hear him. So, um, but, you know, we still have some interesting uh, envelopes set here. Anyway, FM synthesis is just cool. But if I don't want to just do a series change modulation, I can take oscillator 1 and change him to FM cascade 2. And now we see you get this little complicated wiring here so that 1 is also modulating 3. So 1 and 2 are both modulating 3. Basically that means that 1 and 2 are added together and then that signal is used to modulate 3. And any one of these oscillators, they're all set to zero right now for their frequency offset. Any one of these oscillators can have its frequency changed. Now, 
so that was oscillator 2. Now making the same change as oscillator 1, since they're both set to about the same gain, I expect them to make about the same changes. So that should sound the same as this. But you normally wouldn't do that. You'd have them at different frequencies and different levels. Um, not everything sounds like music. Um, so anyway, frequency offset. Every oscillator has one. Oh, while I'm at that. So this offset is in half steps. Um, um, musical octave from C to C to C. From E to E. From G to G. One octave. Frequency is twice as high. Twice as many wiggles per second. Um, so here's your interesting mathematical fact for the day. In a evenly tempered and equal tempered synth uh, synthesizer, <laughs> well tempered clavier, um, the distance between each note is is the same, but only multiplicatively. That is to say, if you take the frequency of this note and multiply it by two, you'll get the frequency of the note an octave above. If you multiply it by something less than two, you'll get the frequency of a note somewhere in between. More than two, you'll get a frequency of a note somewhere up above. So let's just think in terms of, of the concept that there is a magic number that when you multiply it by this frequency, gives you that frequency. And it turns out, when it's evenly tempered, the same magic number, you can multiply it times this key to get that one, but you can multiply this key by the same magic number and get that one. And from this one, you can get that one, and from that one, you can get that one, and then that one, that one, that one, that one. That one half step is this magic number. You multiply by this magic number and it goes up one half step, which is not always the same number of hertz, right? It's a logarithmic scale. Up in the higher frequencies, a small number of hertz doesn't make as big a difference as down in the lower frequencies. Um, and anyway, the magic number is the twelfth root of two. Not the square root of two, but the twelfth root of two. And it just means that if you take the twelfth root of two, if you take this note and multiply it by the twelfth root of two, you get this guy. Multiply the twelfth root of two again, you get this guy. By twelfth root again, you get this guy. Again, 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 until after you've gotten this far, you've multiplied it a total of 12 times. So you've got the 12th root of 2 times itself 12 times. Something times itself 12 times is that thing to the 12th power. So now you've got the, the 12th root of 2, which is the 1 over 12th power, <laughs> times the 12th, and they cancel out, and you get the 1th root of 2, which is just 2. So that's why the magic number is the 12th root of 2, which is very close to 1. 1. 1.000 oh something or other. And that's what makes it well-tempered. Uh, but anyway, um, so half steps is one way of changing frequency. We also have this thing called detune, which... It, it changes it so slightly that you don't hear it, but if you have two oscillators playing next to each other, actually I can do that, can't I? We'll just have two oscillators, and we'll have them both at zero. And we'll make them about the same loudness. Have them both go off of the same 
contour generator. Okay, so we can't tell the difference. Now we make one of them a little sharp. And we hear that. Eh, that's a full half tone sharp. That's a beat frequency. Go back, go to full half tone flat. Pretty much the same beat frequency. Okay, now back in tune, no beat frequency. Now we use detune and we go up, I don't know, 10 cents. That's, that's 10 cents is 10% of a semitone. So now here the beat frequency is, is it was brrr, now it's whoa, 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 whoa. If I bring them even closer, like five cents, that just gets slower. And it's like when you're tuning a guitar and you're getting close to the two strings being in tune, you want to go until this beat frequency hits zero. But in a synthesizer, a zero beat tends to be a little on the boring side and adding just a little bit of detune can make two frequencies that used to be phase locked with each other it can make them slide gently next to each other and that that's pleasing to the ear so long as it's not so as long as it doesn't sound out of tune and what I notice a lot of people do is if they have three oscillators, they'll have one detuned a little flat. Well, have one on pitch, then they'll have one detuned a little flat and one detuned a little sharp. And they feel that that gives them also sort of a chorus effect where you otherwise configure the oscillator the same way so that you kind of have two oscillators, two voices, and they are slightly different. And then the other thing hidden in this corner here is you almost always want to be in relative mode, R-E-L. So the keyboard is used. Whatever gate signal started the note, it provides its frequency. I hit middle C, it's middle C, and then you can give me a up or down from that. Um, um, so the algorithm mixing allows you to um, either send an oscillator to the mixer or to send it into the modulation of a downstream oscillator. Um, FM modulation, you know, it may sound scary, but, you know, you've got a whistle. It's going at a frequency. You modulate it by making that frequency go up and down. You're an FM modulator. Congratulations. Um, it's not that big a deal. It's just interesting that when that when it runs at like speed, we call it vibrato, and it it's a way to, you know, you're playing a long note and you don't want to just be going ah. So vibrato and tremolo are ways to kind of you know add emotion. I'm suffering so much now. Um, but when the it's the same effect when it goes faster just a little bit above vibrato it becomes a little motorboat kind of thing going on but then you keep going up from there and all of a sudden it turns into these beautiful you know musical effects and uh it's neat it's cool thank you john chowning sir is there anything on this map that i haven't actually talked about that's pretty much it. These gate signals that go to create note events, which then drive a synthesizer, the same gate signals, the raw gate signals, are also sent to the sequencer where they can be recorded in a groove. And then when you play the groove back, the gate signals come back out of it and they create new notes. And those go in the note cloud and then each note as an individual has all this crap going on. I guess I could talk about the uh, reverb a little bit. Let's pick an instrument. Okay, so we go to knobs, and there's a thing called reverb, and it's turned off. We turn it on.
So I turn it off. This is my attempt to sound like a piano. It's not too bad. It has a pretty limited range where it sounds reasonable. That's not too bad. Sometimes I like it more than other times. But it's got a, a strong hit at the beginning and then long sustain. And we go to reverb. And what happens is basically it's an echo chamber, but instead of just one wall, I mean, you can have one wall. Like here it is, an echo chamber with a single wall. So, fade versus ring. This is the feedback inside of the system. And if you have it up too high, it'll never, it'll never stop. So it's basically just a recirculating echo. It's a delay line with taps at various points and then the signal comes out of the taps so it's delayed by you know this tap is delayed by this much this tap is delayed a little more the delayed signals are then added together and scaled and fed back in as feedback so that they go in a second time a third time a fourth time a fifth time and so long as this as, as the feedback knob is low enough they're a little quieter each time you know is that what that is about uh, is that what this is about? Uh, it's a little suspicious that my first echo is louder than my original signal. But after that, it makes sense. So anyway, so uh, there's only a single wall here. It's 950 feet away. If I do that, now the range is 15 to 950. <clears throat> I forget how many taps I have. I think it's around eight. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll, every time you tap this control, I'll generate a new random selection of tap points. Hi. And um, as long as you don't go for the hundreds of feet, you can get something that's more of a reverby kind of sound. And if you don't like what you're hearing, you can tap it and you'll get a different effect. So then we turn it off. Other instruments. This guy's actually pretty loud. Anyway, so that's how the reverb works. And then I think that covers this. So we can wave our hands about the vocoder a little bit, but just real quick. You got a microphone. Samples come in, they go into this circular buffer, circular sample buffer. This holds about one minute's worth of samples. 25 times a second, I grab the most recent samples that came in, and I put them through my, my filter array to generate a spectrum, detecting which frequencies are present. And I have two different kinds of filter arrays. It's like two different kinds of harmonicas, one that's just musical notes and one that's uh, notes of use in the human vocal tract. Anyway, the output of this is a spectrum. Um, after that, I go through a thing I call peak 
detection where I basically just take the first derivative of the spectrum and find the uh, peaks. Um, and I used to do a lot of feature analysis there to see if it was really a good peak because, you know, this is usually pretty noisy looking. Um, but right now I'm going for simplicity, and so I'm pretty much just finding peaks at this level and saying I'm, I'm not saying whether or not I care about this peak, it's just is a peak. Then after the peak detector, I have this thing called the harmonic suppressor. And what I do there is I go from left to right, and for each peak, or proposed peak, I look to see, um, does are there other peaks whose relationship to this peak are that of a second, third, fourth, fifth harmonic. And if there are, then I say to myself, well, they may not be real notes that I really care about. They may just be harmonics of this note that I care about. And so I also then ask, I look to the left and say, is there any chance that I am a harmonic to some other lower note? And if in fact something is dubbed to be a harmonic, I rob some portion of its energy based upon how much I think it is a harmonic and I give it to what I claim to be the fundamental. And the effect that I'm trying to fix there, one is cutting down the total number of notes I'm recording because I don't want, I don't want one note that you play to show up as two notes because it had a strong harmonic. Um, but also because in a lot of instruments, in particular the recorder, the way you play the note um, can vastly change where the energy is. So I may play two notes that, that sound about the same loudness to the human brain. Um, but if you look on an oscilloscope, one of them is way quieter. Um, and the, what the quieter one is not only quieter, but its fundamental is particularly quieter because it has a lot of its energy in its harmonics. And I tell myself that if you take all the energy of all those harmonics, maybe then it is about as loud as the other person. Maybe that's why humans perceive it as being approximately the same. Because otherwise the humans are just wrong. Um, but so my goal is to remove the harmonics at this stage. And then after the harmonics removal, I, or suppression, then I have to ask myself, I have to look at each of these peaks over time, you know, over several spectrums, and say, does it look like that's just random out of the blue one time, in which case I'll just ignore it as noise, or does it look like a rising edge of a, of a note? You know, it's like, oh, a note has started happening. Uh, so I see energy from, that, from this filter for several spectrums in a row. It's getting louder and louder. Oh, now it's getting quieter and quieter. Oh, now it's all gone. So in theory, the life cycle of a note is over a series of spectrums, 25 times a second, the lifetime of the note is played out by its spectral frequency peak starting off zero, getting big, getting small again. Um, and when I see that pattern in a peak, then I say, well, you are not only a peak, but you are probably a note. And once I have that, then I do some additional work to try and figure out the exact start and end point of that note. And I'm trying to do this in real time, so I can't just wait for the end of the note before going on. So that makes it harder. Um, but these signals, the start and end signals, I then send to the sequencer as another gate signal to be recorded and to... I can play this live, but it ends up... Uh, you know, if I, if, if, I, if I decode this and then play it out loud, you'll hear it in the microphone, and, unless you're wearing earbuds. But then there's enough delay in the system that you'll be hearing a delayed signal. So for co-performance, my goal is this analysis pattern here basically lets the computer know what you're doing, what music you're doing, what rhythm you're playing at, what key you're playing in. And then it can say to itself, well, there's nothing I can do really reactive to individual notes, but I see where he's headed, so I can predict that his next note is likely to be this, and his next note is likely to happen at this future point in time. And because I now know that in the future, I can schedule to play a note along with that, that I hope, you know, just like a regular person trying to jam along with you is hopefully going to play something that sounds nice with you, against you. Um, so anyway, so I do want to eventually get to the point where it is, you can have the speaker on at the same time as the microphone, 
and it's smart enough to ignore itself. Anyway, you know where that's going. Uh, I drew this. This was a scratch drawing that I was going to turn into a nice drawing, but I'm not sure there's any real point. What's this? Filters. Yeah, it's just another way of saying the same thing. Yeah, I was going going to go for this kind of a structure where I could talk about the um, the logical modules as part of the processing of the signal and give a example signal of what I see at each stage and then take that information and use it to inform oscilloscope improvement so that you really could monitor <laughs> each of those stages. And uh, I think that's it. That's what our goal was. We have achieved it. Uh, lots to cut out and the end.